Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Before I get started, I would like to give a very special thank you to the Reform members of Back to Ashes. Denise S., Emily Clover, Through Scrutiny, Samantha Place, Lisa Radford, Tina Mead, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Mana Ash, Norman D.W., Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. If you would like to become a member of the Back to Ashes channel, that information can be found below. Thank you to everyone who donated to my GoFundMe that is still open and taking donations. That information can be found in the description as well. If you are new here or haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment as it does help push these videos into the YouTube algorithm. Thank you in advance. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crazy Neighbor Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play. After that, there will be no more ads within this video. My wife and I purchased our first house about three years ago. While moving in, there were my new neighbors drinking on the front porch. No big deal. While bringing the last load of boxes into the house, my neighbor comes up, welcomes me to the neighborhood, mentions how nice my TV is. Fast forward one week. We are headed out to dinner. This neighbor stops me before getting in the car and asks how long I will be gone huge red flag. I lie and tell him I'm just running to the gas station one block away and will be back immediately. 20 minutes later, I get a phone call from the local police. This moron broke into my house in broad daylight with three other neighbors watching. Luckily, these neighbors weren't pieces of shit too. He cut his hand on the window he was attempting to climb through and used his bleeding hand on every doorknob in my house. He is now a number in the U.S. penal system. When I was growing up, my rear neighbor Janet and my mom were both going through rough divorces at the time. My mom mostly kept to herself at first. Janet did not take that approach. At first, it seemed frustrating, but reasonable. We had dogs in a fenced-in yard in the suburbs. One day, the dogs were left outside and barked too long. Janet filed a noise complaint. Then she started filing noise complaints any time she saw the dogs outside. Then my mom started keeping them inside more. Then Janet filed complaints when she could hear the dogs barking inside, or when she heard someone else's dogs, or really just whenever she felt like it. Because this wasn't about the noise, it was about Janet feeling a sense of control over something during an out-of-control divorce. Eventually, the cops must have told Janet she had to stop calling them. So she started calling animal control instead. The cops had, we presume told her that she was at risk of a criminal charge for abusing police services. But animal control had no such protections. They had to come out when someone filed a loose animal report. It got to the point where animal control knew what was happening and would come to our door to make small talk with my mom just to file their report. They told her, though, that as long as the calls happened, they had to at least come out. Then my mom had a feather-brained idea. Whenever animal control showed up, my mom would buy a two-pack of lawn flamingos and put them in her yard. She was a teacher, so she got up early. When she did, she'd take the flamingos and make them stare at Janet's front door. Then she'd get home earlier than Janet and move them around just like normal decor. Whenever Janet made a call, my mom bought more flamingos, and whenever Janet made a call, a bigger and bigger flock of lawn flamingos stared at her the day after she left for work, but would be casually mingling when she got home. I can only imagine what she must have thought. One would have to think she questioned her sanity, both because of the movement and the incremental growth, but 
By the time it got to twelve or so, lawn flamingos giving her the hundred-yard glare, she made the connection. Janet never made a call to animal control again after that. We rented a house that had another apartment in the basement. The lady who lived below us kept to herself for the most part, so we didn't see her much. Part of our rental was a detached garage, and she asked if she could put a small deep freezer in our garage. We were using it for storage, so we were fine with it. After a couple of weeks of having her freezer in there, it somehow got unplugged and she came unglued on us and wanted us to pay to replace everything. I understood her frustration, but we hardly ever went into the garage since it was only for storage. In other words, we definitely didn't unplug it and our landlord agreed, but she was pissed. She had a son in college who came home for the summer. During that summer, he found a cat and brought it home. His mom said no cats inside, so he would feed the kitten outside. She was pretty wild. He left for school again in the fall, and we noticed that the cat was getting very thin. We started feeding her outside in her usual spot. Around Christmas, we bought a bag of cat food, and I made a plate of cookies and left them both at our neighbor's front door. The next day, they were both back on our porch. Rude. Whatever. We continued to feed the cat because she obviously wasn't feeding her. A few weeks later, the cat came to our door crying. She was trying to come inside. Super weird considering she was pretty wild and we had never let her inside before. I let her in and noticed she was pregnant and for sure about to have babies. I made her a little corner and she had babies the next day. We let her stay in the house with us, but we knew we couldn't keep her. I went downstairs to talk to her neighbor. She said that her son's cat was a boy, and so the cat we had obviously wasn't his. I posted on Facebook to see if anyone was interested in fostering a cat and her kittens, because we couldn't keep her. Her son saw my post on Facebook and got super mad at his mom. She then called the cops and said that I stole her cat and lied to her when she confronted me about having the cat in my possession. It was the stupidest, most frustrating thing that had ever happened to me as far as neighbors go. We had some neighbors that used to leave their garbage out in plastic bags the night before garbage day instead of putting it in a bin. Around here, that's just ringing the dinner bell for raccoons and other critters. Sure enough, come morning, there's garbage strewn all over the neighborhood. What the raccoons and skunks didn't spread around, the wind picked up the slack. Some of the people on the street kindly approached the guy and asked him to put his garbage in a bin. He told them to go F themselves. Thus began the garbage wars. Every morning of garbage day, some people on my street would collect all the half-eaten and rotten trash from their lawns and toss it back into the dude's yard. He would collect it, then dump it back on their lawns, or cram it into their bushes. People started finding half-eaten burritos and candy wrappers in their mailboxes. The street started to look like a slum. Police were called, health inspectors, city by law enforcement. Each side was calling in whatever authority they could muster to get their enemy into some shit. The dude and his family, amazingly his wife seemed perfectly pleasant, lasted about eight months and then moved. Every once in a while I'll find a random margin lid or piece of styrofoam in my hedge and my mind goes back to those dark days of war. My family and I used to live in a rough neighborhood when I was a kid. One night it was just my mom, my two siblings and I at home and my dad was gone on a business trip. Around midnight, someone started knocking on our door. 
My mom woke up, went to the front door and asked who it was. No one answered. She thought that maybe it was some kids playing ding-dong ditch, so she went back to bed. About 30 minutes later, again, someone starts knocking. She gets up and peers through the side window to see if she can spot anyone out there, but nobody is there. She starts to worry, so she goes back to the room, grabs my dad's double barrel, and sits in the living room in the dark, waiting. Then, more knocking. My mom begins shouting at whoever it is that she is going to call the cops, and that if anyone tries to come in, she would shoot them. At about 2 a.m., the police finally showed up and do a quick search outside of our house while we waited inside. After their search, they tell my mom that they found a piece of barbed wire about four feet long next to the front door and ask if it belonged to my mom. She said that it wasn't hers and asked why. The cop told her it belonged to whoever was knocking on the door, that they were planning on strangling my mom with the barbed wire when she opened the door to see who was knocking. They said that she was very smart to not open the door to see who was there, otherwise it would have cost her her life. The cops said that they'd patrol the neighborhood until morning and do a thorough investigation once there was daylight. That morning, as they were searching around the house, they found footprints leading around to the back of the house and up to my bedroom window. They had also found nicks in the windowsill where the person was trying to pry it open to break in but failed. My mom always suspected it was this one neighbor because he would always stare at my mom through his curtains and wasn't very friendly. He also knew when my dad wasn't home, since he knows what vehicle he drives. We moved out of that house right after that incident. So, when I was in high school, there were a few disturbing occurrences in my neighborhood. A woman down the street who lived alone woke up one night to go to the bathroom and heard her TV on in the living room. So, she naturally wandered in there, assuming nothing out of the ordinary. She found a guy sitting on her couch watching the TV. She started screaming, obviously terrified, and the guy ran out of her house. Maybe a week later, further down the street, there was a family with a young daughter. She woke up in the middle of the night with her bed sheets pulled down and a guy tickling her feet. Again, she started screaming and the guy fled. Another week or so later, three houses down where an elderly couple lived, the husband woke up in the middle of the night to find a man standing over his bed and staring at his sleeping wife. The old man started hollering at the guy, and the guy fled again. So now, shit is on super high alert. Cops patrolling regularly, etc. They somehow figured out who it was, and everyone in the neighborhood got a flyer with this picture. Behind us was a densely wooded area that stretches for a couple of miles in every direction. This guy had literally been living in those woods for upwards of a month in a tent, doing God only knows what when he wasn't breaking into houses. But the creepiest part of the story is this. One night in the middle of these incidents, we had our sliding glass door open with just the screen door behind it shut. This was in the summer, by the way. We had a big backyard and it was pitch black back there at night. Our dog suddenly jolted up and started growling viciously, like I'm talking tail stiff as a board, hair on his neck standing up, etc. Our dog was the best, nicest dog, like, ever. He has never done that before. So naturally, we were like, what the hell? My father jumped up and put the floodlight over the deck on to see what was back there, but... There was nothing. The next morning, we were outside doing yard work and noticed the lock on our back gate was broken. Someone had clearly done it. It wasn't like it was wear and tear or something like that. It's very safe to assume that this guy had tried to get into our backyard and house, 
but was deterred by the dog's growling and barking. 15 out of 10, a very good boy. There are people who hold grudges, and then there are people who take grudges and mold them into their very own bones, like an old oak tree growing over a bicycle. Kim Hoffman's nightmare started when her daughter invited a neighbor girl, Lori Christensen, over to her house to play. The Christensen girl responded by pouring nail polish in young Hoffman's hair. Listen, kids are weird and sucky. This kind of thing happens. When Hoffman confronted the girl's mother over this little snafu, Christensen reacted by initiating a five-year-old harassment campaign against her family. Christensen particularly enjoyed taunting Hoffman, a recovering alcoholic who had recently suffered a life-threatening overdose, with suggestions that she should drink more scotch because she should have died. Just an overall lovely person. The Hoffmans reported the incidents to police, but it wasn't until they caught Christensen on tape crashing their son's 12th birthday party with a remote-controlled car while yelling, Drunk driver, drunk driver, that they were granted a restraining order. This did little to curtail Christensen's antics. Instead, she opted to harass the Hoffmans from a distance, putting up signs in their yard that read, Fat people disgust me, and I saw mommy kissing a breathalyzer. She also started flashing and making masturbatory gestures at the Hoffmans and their children, arguably upping her crimes from felony harassment to sexual assault. The Hoffman settled for charging her with violating the restraining order. Christensen defended herself by claiming she thought the order only applied to the people and not their property, and that it was her right under the First Amendment to put up the signs. You know, her Twitter feed is just unbearable. She was sentenced to 90 days in jail and several years of probation, during which she's not allowed to be within one mile of the Hoffman's home, a radius which includes her own. Oh, she also lost her job in the process. It was one of those rare occasions in which someone managed to be a pure asshole themselves right onto the street. Talk about karma. She's a bitch. Tanya Saylor lived in Pennsylvania with her terminally ill husband and five children, including a 17-year-old with cancer. You could say she had her hands full. She certainly didn't have time to deal with her neighbor's effing drama. We mean that quite literally. You see, Saylor's teenage daughter slept in a room that shared a wall with that of their neighbor, Amanda Warfel, who really liked to have sex. Last we checked, that describes most post-pubescent humans, but most of those accept that apartment living demands keep the audio to a minimum. It seems Warful never learned this lesson, and the noises frequently kept the girls awake at night. After noise-blocking headphones proved futile, Sailor went next door and asked Warful if perhaps she could tone it down a notch or two so that Salyer's cancer-stricken daughter might get some sleep. Not only did Warful have even louder sex in response, she also started getting creative. Her dirty talk began including racial epithets directed at the girls next door, as well as vivid descriptions of the sex acts taking place, which must have been hella weird for whoever was assisting with said acts. This went on for two years often into the wee hours of the morning. Salyer stated that she didn't even really care about the derogatory language. She was more fed up with her daughters being late for school due to lack of sleep. The state police actually had to write notes on two occasions to excuse her tardiness. Eventually, Werfel was sentenced to 45 to 90 days in New York County Prison for excessive banging. <laughs> I'm sorry, you all. (laughs) 
For whatever reason, Jason Clark had spent a fortune turning his house into a kind of spy fortress. Complete with a bright orange fence, motion-activated spotlights, and security cameras. Inside, he kept an arsenal of rifles, pistols, and 40,000 rounds of ammunition. He mowed his lawn dressed in black and wearing a hockey mask. If he had stopped there, his neighbors may have written him off as merely terrifying. But he would also shout at pedestrians, shine spotlights onto passing drivers, and into people's homes. That upgrades him from terrifying to just a downright nuisance. One of the Clark's favorite targets was neighbor Joe Gross. For reasons that aren't terribly clear, Clark poisoned Gross's lawn, which would be a hilariously suburban prank if it hadn't resulted in the death of Gross's dog. Things got so bad that Gross tried to sell his house, but Clark wouldn't let that happen either, scaring the realtors away with his harassment. It seems he didn't want to let his plaything go. Gross ended up giving his house away to his church, but the neighbors who couldn't afford to donate themselves into homelessness continued to suffer, like Tony Calhoun, who lived a few blocks away and was just visiting someone in the neighborhood, when Clark up and ran over him. Shockingly, Clark had previously been convicted of harassing neighbors in another part of town, and all those guns he was stockpiling were a huge violation of the protective order he was under. As of 2016, he was facing up to 20 years in prison. It should be noted that he was found competent to stand trial, because the legitimately mental ill are nowhere near this jerk. Barry Aldolf kissed a four-year-old on the lips, allegedly. There's no good way of saying that. The child's parents, Matt and Bethany Kostelnik, reported the incident to the police, which was a crime that Aldolf considered far worse than molesting a child. To get even, Aldolf spent two weeks hacking the Kostelnik's WEP-encrypted Wi-Fi network. Once he was in, he enacted a meticulous campaign of electronic terrorism, which mostly involved attempting to frame Matt Kostelnik for possession of child pornography. He began by creating a fake MySpace page for Matt, which contained child pornography. Fortunately for Kostelnik, the last person who looked at a MySpace page died in 2007. Ardolf then used Kostelnik's work email to send child pornography to, a co-worker, as well as suggestive messages to Kostelnik's female colleagues. Kostelnik, of course, denied being the one responsible for the emails, and thankfully, his superiors gave him the benefit of the doubt. They hired a firm that specializes in this kind of thing, which is apparently common enough that entire firms exist to specialize in it. They installed a packet sniffer on the Kostelnik's network, whereupon they discovered that Ardolf was doing. The Secret Service also got involved because Ardolf emailed death threats to Joe Biden. The man is truly heartless. The FBI also got involved and uncovered evidence that Ardolf had staged a similar harassment campaign against a couple in Brooklyn. What did that couple do to incur Ardolf's wrath? Supposedly, the personal care attendant who looked after their disabled twin daughters parked in front of Ardolf's house. Ardolf was sentenced to 18 years for having really weird ideas of what constitutes a slight. Also, cyber terrorism. In 2001, David and Joan Gallant bought a house that sat next to the Murphys' property. For reasons unknown, the Gallants soon found their new home under smelly siege by the Murphys. Over the course of a year, the Murphys dumped hundreds of loads of cow manure along the border of their property. 
David would sometimes wake up at four in the morning to the sound of a loader beeping as it delivered fresh piles of wet cow shit right beyond his property line. The piles got so high that they could be visible on Google Earth. A judge eventually put a stop to all of this and awarded the gallants $15,000 in damages, after which he officially ordered the Murrays to, wait for it, keep their shit to themselves. <laughs> I'm sorry, you all. <laughs> Karma really is a bitch. My neighbor where I currently live called my fiancé and told him I was cheating on him. She took pictures and all and sent them to him. When we first moved into this new place, I was six months pregnant. Our neighborhood welcomed us to the neighborhood very nicely. Then my fiancé switched jobs and had to travel for three weeks to another state. He was worried leaving me alone in a new neighborhood at six months pregnant so we decided to talk to our next-door neighbor. We talked to them. They were very nice. The husband was in the Army for 20 years and then became a deputy sheriff. The wife was a stay-at-home mom. Then my fiancé told them if it'd be too much to ask for their number in case I needed it for an emergency or what not. My fiancé told them that he was going to be traveling and that he was worried of leaving me home alone. Even with the home alarm system, my fiancé worried so much about me. Anyways, the neighbors came over a couple of times to our house before my fiancé had to travel. We noticed the wife was overly nice. You know, the type who's way too nice to be true. So my fiancé leaves out of state, and during one of those days, my younger brother calls me and tells me he will be around the area, and if he could hang out with me and have lunch with me. I said sure, and we went for lunch. It had been a very long time since I'd seen my brother, so when we met at the restaurant, he was being very sweet. He would put his arm around my shoulder, and we were just having a good time. From the corner of my eye, I feel someone just looking my way. I turn around, and there she was, my neighbor with her phone out. It seemed like she was taking a picture of us. When she saw me, she quickly put the phone down and waved at me. I told my brother she was our neighbor, and we went on with our day. My fiancé then texts me about an hour later. The neighbor just sent me these pictures. She thinks you're cheating on me with someone, but I haven't told her that's your brother. Should I play along? To this day, she cannot look me in the eye. I once had a retired Italian barber as a neighbor. Tony was active, rode his bike, planted in his garden, and kept his property immaculate, as retired Italian barbers often do. Tony had a lot to say. If I touched the curb between our driveways and it left even a faint tire mark on my side, mind you, Tony would offer some parking advice. The list of neighborly happenings subject to Tony's hawk-like attention was endless. But he wasn't really a bad guy. He tried to say things in a nice way. He just had an unstoppable urge to control every aspect of his home life. I could sympathize even though I tended toward the other extreme. Feuding with neighbors was something I wanted to avoid. So I would usually nod my head and tell him I understood the problem. Tony's wife, Anna, was an absolute charm. Just a lovely lady. And she would tell us, when Tony wasn't around, to ignore his constant complaints. One day, Tony caught me getting out of my car and he shared his latest laminate. My driveway sloped down from the house to the road. Apparently, when I pulled into my driveway later in the evening, after 11 p.m., my headlight would temporarily shine on one of his upstairs windows. 
It turns out Tony was trying to sleep in that bedroom, and he didn't appreciate the headlights shining in his window for the two seconds it took me to park. But Tony, to nobody's surprise, had a ready solution. He told me if I came home late, I should just park on the road and not in my driveway, and the problem would be solved. Now, I was an old hand at fielding Tony's complaints, but this one seemed extreme, so it gave me pause. But there was something about Tony that made it hard to get too mad. He had a real Don Quixote vibe, as he struggled dealing with people like me, who frustrated his desire for 100% orderly perfection in his home life. I suppressed a smile and told him I would try not to disturb his sleep in the future. I went into the house, went on about my business, and forgot about Tony. But, 30 minutes later, I heard a knock on the door, and when I answered, you guessed it, there stood Tony. I wondered what the new complaint might be, but when I opened the door, Tony was squirming big time, like a 10-year-old kid being forced to apologize. He was mumbling, and his accent was pretty thick to begin with, but I instantly figured out what was going on. Tony had told Anna the headlight problem was solved, and I would henceforth park on the road when getting home late. Anna, like the peach that she was, instantly demanded that Tony knock on our door and let us know, in no uncertain terms, that we were free to drive up our driveway any time we felt like it, morning, noon, or night. And then Tony, with a mighty effort, apologized and said he might have been a little out of line. I was giggling inside. I looked across the driveway and there was Anna, arms crossed, making sure Tony did exactly what she had directed him to do. We only lived a year longer in that house and, of course, Tony could not entirely curb his propensity for offering helpful little suggestions. But for some reason, I just couldn't take offense. It must have been a frustrating ordeal for a guy like Tony to be neighbors with a guy like me. We didn't move far, but would often see Anna around the neighborhood. She was such a beautiful soul. Then we didn't see her anymore and discovered she passed away from cancer. I was devastated for Tony. Anna was the sun that Tony orbited, brightening up his days and keeping him in the good graces of all. I think that Anna quite often and marvel at what a warm, caring woman she was and how lucky we were to have such a neighbor. And Tony, at the end of the day, was memorable too. I still smile all these years later at the thought of Tony mumbling his apology outside our door. I moved not too long ago, but my old neighbors were the worst. The place across the street was a duplex and had a revolving door of awful people. The first year I lived at that place wasn't too bad. It was a reclusive guy on one side and a woman with three kids on the other. The only problem was this woman wouldn't watch her kids at all. They would be playing in the road all the time. In the summer, they were up till midnight every single night. The worst part was none of these kids could have been over 10 years old. One of them always bounced on a pogo stick. I'd just hear that annoying sound until midnight. It's like that effing kid did nothing else but bounce on that damn pogo stick. Every night I'd fall asleep to a sound I can only equate to two overweight people having sex on a bed of springs. The reclusive old man moved out and shit got really bad. Every few months people would move in and prove themselves to be worse than the last tenants. First group of people would sit on their porch all day yelling at people who walked past them all day, every day. Hey girl. What is your fine ass doing? Where the hell are you going? Stop and talk to me, you stupid bitch. That was an interesting few months. 
Then they got replaced by these people who were just loud. They didn't seem too bad until one night when the girls of the house got into a drunken fight at 2 a.m. They started beating the shit out of each other in the street. One girl drunkenly fled to her car and sideswiped three cars on the street before crashing. The last lot was the worst. They were obviously drug dealers and had swarms of people in and out of the place and blocking traffic. This got really annoying really fast, but still tolerable. Then they started throwing insanely loud parties every night. The main kicker was the one dude who lived there wouldn't drive anywhere without a beer. I've never actually seen anyone drink and drive. The dude would just stumble to his car at 11 a.m. with a beer in his hand almost every single day. I never saw this guy get into his car without a beer. Occasionally, he would just chug it and then throw it on the ground as he got in. The other problem with these neighbors was broken glass. They would throw their empty liquor bottles into the street constantly. I never bothered to get cops involved until the neighbors had moved in. Apparently, everyone on my street had complained about them, but they were still there when I moved out. 2,600 miles later, and I finally have much better neighbors. I lived in a three-story apartment building on the middle floor. The bottom floor was basement apartments. It was a very quiet building, and a lot of people were older and lived there ten years or more. Then this creepy asshole moved in below us. He would play music loud all night, and I had to be up for work at 5 a.m. He wouldn't answer the door, so we could ask him to turn it down. So I had to jump up and down until he heard it. He had pissed off girls banging on his door screaming for hours, and he was home but wouldn't answer. She ran out and poured nail polish all over his car. His apartment was basement, but he had a huge window that was right next to the stairs to get in. He never closed the curtains, and you would see directly down into his living room, where he had built a sex wing with bondage stuff hanging on it. I had to explain what it was to everyone that came over, even my mom. Then, one day, a cop knocked on the door, and he was holding about 20 pairs of women's underwear, and asked me to pick out mine. It was like three pairs, and the cop ordered me to throw them away because the downstairs neighbor had been wearing them because he was stealing them out of the laundry room. I guess the upstairs neighbor was walking in the building and seen her underwear hanging on the sex swing and called the cops. So they arrested him for stealing her underwear. The landlord evicted him. When he got out of jail, he was so pissed he was getting evicted. He went and bought a bunch of sand and covered the whole apartment in sand and turned the air conditioner all the way up and left it after he switched the electric back into the landlord's name. He definitely was a nightmare neighbor. Thank God he is gone. Warning, this next story has strong language, not suitable for children or for anyone sensitive to this type of language. Listening discretion is advised. When my wife and I moved into our house in the summer of 2019, the neighbors on either side of us warned us about the people renting the house directly behind ours. Apparently, they had been known to cause trouble and blow things way out of proportion, bordering on paranoia of everyone around them. We kept it in mind but had no issues for the first six months or so after moving in. Their house sits on a hill behind ours and so overlooks the majority of our backyard due to the elevation change. Well, one night, morning technically, at about 3 a.m., we wake up to ring notifications from our phones showing video from our front doorbell. There's a man standing barefoot in a sleeveless shirt on our porch, 
pounding on our front door. We give it two to three minutes just watching him on the app, thinking maybe he's drunk and he has the wrong house, essentially giving him the benefit of the doubt. But then we start to hear him say, Come out, you fucking pussy, I'm gonna fuck you up, etc. And he leaves the porch and starts to head around to the side of the house towards our backyard. Considering we had no idea who this was, my wife now immediately calls the police as I move out of our bedroom towards the external doors to listen and look for any attempt of home invasion. At this point, our neighbors directly behind us throw a huge spotlight into our backyard from theirs. We're thinking, okay, cool, they know something is up and they're trying to help us out by shedding light onto our backyard. The cops arrive several long minutes later and knock. We explain the situation and they head out back to look around and get the scoop from the neighbors with the spotlight. It turns out that the spotlight neighbor was the one on our porch. He had jumped our fence into our backyard and up into his yard and then threw the light on. He told the police that several nights prior, I had let my puppy out into my own backyard in the middle of the night and because I was in my boxers that I was trying to expose myself to his family because they could look down on our entire yard from where theirs sits. He then followed this up to the police with evidence, which consisted of videos he had taken through our windows of my wife and I inside of our own home doing totally normal things like chores, watching TV, etc. Nothing inappropriate or scandalous. Not that it would have mattered anyway. We were in our own home. Because of the elevation difference, if they went out of their way, they could technically slightly see through our closed blinds due to the angle. So they had been filming us for no reason at all and expected the police to see this as reasonable? The cops came back in and my wife was devastated. A huge breach of our privacy, of course, and totally unfounded accusations as we had never done anything to anger these people. We hadn't even met them, technically. The police told us, just don't worry about it. If he tries something else again, just give us a call, which wasn't the most comforting at the time. They moved out a few months later without any additional issues. My wife and I celebrated like it was a holiday when we saw the moving van in their driveway. My dad lives in an apartment, and one day, he came home to cops outside of his door. It was very early, 5 or 5.30 a.m. They asked if they could ask him a few questions, and my dad said, of course. He invited them in and made them breakfast. They asked him some questions about his neighbor across the hall, just general stuff like, have you noticed anything weird, etc. My dad told them no. He looks like a well-put-together 30-ish-year-old businessman. My dad lives in higher-end apartments, so this is what everyone looks like. Nothing weird or out of the ordinary. The cops go on to explain that a 30-year-old woman is missing and was last seen by a security camera walking into the building with this man. But they never had any footage of her, or him for that matter, leaving the apartment. The cops stay outside and monitor the apartment until about 5 p.m. that night, when they finally get a warrant. They notice a shower curtain missing and golf clubs scattered on the bedroom floor. They ended up arresting the guy. Fast forward three weeks and the cops find her body about 45 minutes south in the woods on the side of a bike trail. Some runner stumbled upon her. Nothing more was released on what state she was in. Then, about two months ago, they found more tapes as the investigators went back to look at them. They discovered the man leaving the apartment with his golf bag, but like I said earlier, all of his clubs were in his room. I'm sure many people have put two and two together. A full-size woman wouldn't fit in a golf bag, but... 
that's how he got her out. His trial is coming up. As of right now, he claims it was an accident, and he panicked and tried to hide it since he had a girlfriend. I entered the door, totally looking a fright. I was wearing flannel pajamas and had one of my 15-year-old twin sons clinging to my leg and the other held in my arms. They were both grizzling. By the way, in British and Aussie terms, that means whining and complaining. Because it was around 5.30 p.m., just on dusk of a winter's evening. I was just about to bathe the kids and desperately hoping my husband would arrive home from work soon to help me through the dreaded arsenic hour. Standing in front of me was my next door neighbor Alice, a woman of around 60 years old, who I had reasonably cordial relations with, and I greeted her with a smile and was about to say hello when, without a word of greeting, she said, you've got my bin. I was startled. I was thinking about baths and dinner and when my husband would get home. Um, I'm sorry, pardon? My wheelie bin. You've got my wheelie bin in your driveway. It was a Monday. Every Sunday night we put our rubbish bins, also called wheelie bins, out on the street and our local council trucks come and pick them up. Then we bring them back onto our properties. Apparently, Alice's had a special sticker on it from her husband's workplace, which is how she identifies hers, and her bin was in our driveway. I didn't yet know it, but I pieced together later what had happened. We'd forgotten to put our bin out the night before. My husband Mike heard the truck coming Monday morning, and because we live on a cul-de-sac, we missed the truck on the first run down the street, so Mike put our bin on the later side of the street to be collected on the return run. Then he went off to work. Later, my mom stopped by, and seeing an empty bin sitting between our house and Alice's, which is where we usually put our bin, and our bin spot empty, she thought that it was our bin and brought it in. It was Alice's. An innocent mistake that began the whole bin gate debacle. Our empty bin was sitting across the street the whole time. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, please take it back. Well, that doesn't really make things right, does it? Where's your bin? I, I, I don't know where my bin is, but I'll sort that out. Why did you take our bin? I, I have no idea. There's absolutely been some kind of mix-up. I didn't bring it in. Has it been damaged? What's the problem? Well, Bill, my husband, isn't a well man. He's been beside himself all day wondering where our bin is. He walked up and down the street looking for our bin, and he couldn't find it. Eventually, not being able to find it, he felt compelled to steal somebody else's bin. Now I'm worried that the police are going to get involved, and I just don't know how Bill would cope with prison. Do you know what men do to other men in prison? I stood there, jaw-dropping, thinking I must be being punked, waiting for my friends to jump out and tell me that they put her up to this. I couldn't muster a single word. The kids are starting to grizzle, but I barely even notice. I'm in the freaking twilight zone. I know you young people are all okay with this kind of carry-on and think it's a big deal, but Bill's a different generation, and I just don't know how he'd adapt to prison life and sodomy and all that. Honestly, I think it would kill him. Then she starts giving me the crazy eyes and delivers the immortal line. Why are you trying to murder my husband? At that point, I just wanted her gone. Um, please just take your bin. And I closed the door. And stood there, mouth working, but unable to form words. Sure that it was some kind of elaborate joke. Then I took the kids up for a bath. One of my best dinner party stories ever. Oh, side note. Bill did die a couple years later. She didn't seem terribly upset about it. The undertaker was at the house at around 8 a.m. By noon, the charity shop had been by to collect all of his clothes and other possessions. By mid-afternoon, a car broker had come to take away his car. 
By sunset, she and her daughters were drinking champagne on the veranda, and there was no sign the guy had ever existed. My mom, dad, and I moved into a condo when I was 14. It set up like an apartment building, so we had a neighbor on our right and one below us. When we first moved in, we met Trina, our downstairs neighbor. She was an older woman, in her 60s, taking care of her mentally challenged grandson. My same age, but mentally a six-year-old with minimal language development. She seemed sweet and welcomed us. We had a few small issues, but kept them to ourselves. She smoked, and I do mean a lot, like three to four packs a day, and the smell would overtake our house, and her grandson would scream a lot in the early morning, but nothing serious, and we never said a word. We were all friendly enough, and life was fine. About two years after moving in, my mom bought a portable hose to water her outdoor plants and clean the balcony off. This is when shit hit the fan. Trina lost it when my mom washed the patio for the first time. Just water, no chemicals, just rinsing the dirt off. Trina promptly started screaming about killing my mom for doing this. She then complained to the condo association every single day for years. She started to burn small fires in a coffee can under our windows in an attempt to smoke us out. She once saw my bedroom window was left open and literally flooded my room with her hose. She would call the police on us every single noise we had ever made. It got to the point that if she called the police and they showed up and there wasn't an issue, she would be fined $50. A couple years later, I become pregnant very young. I was 18. And my boyfriend moved in and we had the baby. She told my boyfriend that I had a revolving line of men and I was unsure who the father was but chose him because he was nice. Completely fabricated. She continued with her nonsense for years and years. She once was driving down the driveway while I was getting my then two kids into the car. She literally tried to hit my oldest son with her car. I had to physically pick him up and throw him out of the way. When the police came, she denied everything. She harassed my family for years to the point of the condo association having to have private meetings with her and my dad, which nothing ever came of. The condo association was just as fed up as we were. Three years ago, my mom passed away suddenly of CJD, and when she realized my mom was no longer around, she laughed and told my dad and my kids that my mom deserved to die. She was an awful, awful woman. She recently fell ill with COVID and subsequently had a stroke. We don't know if she is still alive or in a home, but my dad, who lives there, says it's nice to be free of the constant harassment. We got taken to long court. When we bought our very first home, we weren't prepared for the crazy that comes with living in a homeowners association, or HOA, development. Our houses were townhomes, and part of the HOA fee included all lawn care. Great, one less thing to worry about. The townhouse we were buying didn't have a front lawn, though. It was all bushes and flowers. We showed up to closing for the house and learned that the current, soon to be previous, owners had taken out the grass and put in bushes and flowers without permission of the HOA. As such, they presented us with a check for $1,500 to redo the postage stamp size lawn in exchange for them being able to just walk away. So, as soon as we moved in, we met our neighbor, Mario and Mrs. Mario. I can never remember her name, but his is his real name. Mario loved his lawn. He loved his lawn so, so, so much. 
he was out working in his lawn every single day. This lawn was maybe 10 feet by 5 feet, but it was green and lush and perfect. Mario hated that our lawn was covered in bushes, and he was the one who had ratted out the previous owners. We learned that the only reason the previous owners had put in bushes was to get Mario to stop harassing them about the state of their lawn. The previous owners were happy to let the HOA take care of the lawn, and that was unacceptable to Mario. Mario's dream was that we make our lawn identical to his and that we spend the same amount of time on this patch of green as he did. Our dream was to let the HOA take care of it and never have to worry about it. Mario let us know in no uncertain terms that the only acceptable result was his dream and bushes and flowers were certainly of the devil. So, after living there for about a month, we went to lawn court. Turns out the HOA board had no love for Mario. They were tired of his constant complaining. However... The HOA rules were clear. There must be a strip of grass between the bushes and the sidewalk to keep mulch from getting onto the sidewalk. We asked if we could just put in a small amount of grass and keep 75% of the bushes. They said, of course. So we spent about $200 on dirt and grass to come into compliance and came out ahead on the professional landscaping money we'd received in closing. Mario was furious. He complained to the HOA again. They informed him that we had their permission. He made it his mission to spy on us. Anytime we were outside, he or Mrs. Mario would open their front door and then stand flat against the wall, thinking we couldn't see them so they could hear what we were saying. We talked loudly about our plans for our yard. Pirate flags, flamingos, bigger, more obnoxious bushes. In reality, we watered our bushes and let the HOA mow and fertilize the grass. It was fun watching them get so angry at not being able to control us or our lawn. They moved a couple of years later, and we were not sorry to see them go. The first time my boyfriend came to spend a weekend with me at my former apartment, we were quietly enjoying each other's company inside when that jarring knock at the door made it clear there were police outside. It was obvious when I answered the door that I was scrambling to put clothes on. My next door neighbor had called them and accused me of breaking into their apartment through the ceiling and redecorating. I just laughed. After a few minutes, the cops left and we went back to what we were doing. The second time I answered the door while pulling my clothes back on, it was the officers who were laughing. They apologized but said they had to look around. This time the neighbors had said we had a gun. This was fabricated. We did not own one. There was a little attic access hatch over the shower complete with unmolested cobwebs that no one had been up there. Still chuckling, the officers apologized again, and one of them said the neighbors were tweaking their asses off. It was clear from my twice answering the door in various stages of undress that my boyfriend and I had other activities in mind, which did not involve redecorating the neighbor's apartment by force. But we've been together for a while now. Maybe this weekend we can do a few hostile makeovers. Well, there are some doozies here, but I think I can supply a couple from our ex-neighbor. He had a garage with a room over it and a door and external staircase going down to the ground from it. Evidently, he decided one day that the landing wasn't level enough. So he gets a ladder, saws off the support, and knocks a wedge into it. Doesn't secure it at all, mind you. 
Still not happy, he goes down to the bottom of the same support and while standing under the landing, saws the support off at the bottom and knocks a wedge into it. Later that year, we saw him on the roof in a rainstorm working with an electric circular saw. Where we live, a simple phone call will get a representative from the utility companies to come out and mark where all the utility lines run on your property for free before you dig. He managed not only to not do this, but three times cut through the electric main that serves our entire street. Not once, not twice, but three times. His daughter managed to drive her car through a fence into a cow pasture. We got our SUV and towed the car out. There was a lot of thanking Jesus, but no one ever thanked us. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true crazy neighbor stories. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.